The title of this lecture is Old School Imaging of the Brachial Plexus. So why would you come online and watch a video on old school imaging when you could learn about the newest type of imaging, the brachial plexus? I think there's a big focus now on neurography and other advanced sequences, but most of the diagnoses that you're going to make in the brachial plexus are really going to be made on traditional T1 and T2 weighted images. And so that's what I really want to focus on and really where I want to establish differential diagnoses. So what's the old school protocol for MRI of the brachial plexus? I think one of the most important things to understand is an emphasis on sagittal imaging. Almost all of your diagnoses are going to be made in the sagittal plane. Almost all of the examples I'll show you in this lecture are from the sagittal plane T1 and T2 weighted sequences. Of particular importance is the non-fat saturated T1 weighted image because that fat is going to be a natural contrast agent for you and really show off the nerves well. There, you can go with a T2 fat sat or a STIR. Uh, STIR is usually a little bit better because it has more uniform fat saturation. The size of the human body varies a lot as you go from the head to the neck and from the neck to the chest, and that sort of messes up your fat saturation. It can cause a lot of artifacts that, in addition to motion and pulsation artifacts, can really make it hard to see the brachial plexus. Uh, we often do both. T2 fat sat and stir, but the key is to get uniform fat saturation. Post contrast imaging, I really like post contrast imaging, especially in tumor cases, but even in situations of trauma, I like the post contrast, uh, so I push for it, although um, sometimes there's reasons not to give contrast. Um, and then there's neurography. Should we do neurography on every single brachial plexus examination? I think you get some very pretty pictures but I'm not sure how diagnostically useful it is. Obviously, you'll find people who disagree with me entirely and think that neurography is the bomb and is the future of brachial plexus imaging, and I encourage you to weigh those for yourselves. This is an example of neurography. As promised, beautiful imaging. You can absolutely make out the five uh, cervical nerve roots that contribute to the brachial plexus. They're clearly delineated, beautiful picture. Look how T1 is tucked up under the first rib like that beautiful pictures, but um, I'm not sure how much they affect your diagnosis. So for starters, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the brachial plexus. The examples of pathology will be categorized as trauma, neoplasm, inflammation, vascular, and then a special discussion of thoracic outlet syndrome, which is really interesting. When I was a medical student, we used the mnemonic Randy Travis drinks cold beer to remember the segments of the brachial plexus. That reference may be lost these days. Maybe you prefer radiology technologists drink cold beer. In any case, here's what it's supposed to remind you of. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. So how many of each of those are there? Well, there are five cervical nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1, that contribute to the brachial plexus. Certainly C4 and T2 may add a few nerves in there, but the major contributors are those five roots. Those five roots combine into three trunks. C5 and C6 combine together to form an upper trunk. C7 stands alone as the middle trunk. And then C8 and T1 are the lower trunks. So those are three trunks. Each of those trunks has two divisions. Each of the trunks has an anterior and posterior division. This is where most people start to get confused. So there's an anterior division of the upper trunk, a posterior division of the upper trunk, etc. So that gives us a total of six divisions. Those recombine into three cords where the posterior cord is a combination of all three of the posterior divisions. The medial cord is a combination of the upper and middle anterior divisions and the lateral cord is the anterior lower division. Then the branches that come off are the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, all of the nerves, the, the brachial nerve, all the nerves that you're familiar with in the arm. And the plus plus there means there's lots of those. Here's a schematic of what we just talked about. One, two, three, four, five contributing nerve roots, maybe some minor contributions from the surrounding, forming three trunks, then those divide into anterior and posterior divisions, recombine into three cords, and then numerous branches beyond that. If you want to um, stop here and look at this lovely drawing by Charlene Ong, who was a medical student of mine a number of years ago, 
um, uh, pause it here and uh, look at that in detail. Notice that relationship between T1 and the first rib. Okay, let's take that anatomy and look at it radiologically. We're going to be looking on sagittal images with either T2 or T1 weighting, and these are parasagittal images um, off from the cervical spine and extending out into the arm. The first thing we'll do is the same picture I showed you before because it's a beautiful depiction of the five major nerve roots that contribute to the brachial plexus, right? C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 tucked under the first rib. Right, and you can look, take these more medially uh, and on sequential images and trace these back up to the uh, cervical spine and convince yourself that each of these nerves is exactly what I told you it was. Okay, next are the trunks. Remember, we're going to have three trunks, an upper, a middle, and a lower trunk of the brachial plexus. And you can see them here, one, two, three, within this triangle of fat called the scalene triangle. We're going to come back to that scalene triangle as we talk more about the anatomy on a future slide. Here are the divisions. If you look carefully, you can actually see all six of the divisions. As we extend out into the axilla, we are below the level of the clavicle here, so this is axillary artery territory, and these are the divisions entangling around the subclavian artery, uh, well, at this point, axillary artery and vein. Uh, often you can't make them out quite as crisply and clearly. Obviously, I chose my favorite example of that. Um, but you should be able to make out individual nerve roots of about this size. Each nerve root should be surrounded by fat. That's normal, even if you can't ascribe each one of those particularly to the posterior division of the inferior trunk or something like that. Just being able to see them, being able to see them discreetly, uh, make them out from each other, and see them surrounded by fat, that's what you're looking for. Here are the cords. Now, once again, sometimes it's really hard to make these out as an individual structure. Here's the posterior, median, and lateral cords. Uh, sometimes these just look like discrete nerves recombining and twisting around the artery here, and that's fine. Um, uh, obviously, I chose an example that shows the three cords forming uh, well. Uh, here's the same anatomy as seen in the coronal plane, right? Sternocleidomastoid muscle, anterior and middle scalene muscles. Here's the brachial plexus coming through that scalene triangle, right? Right above the axillary artery and the coracoid process of the scapula coming forward there. So you can definitely make out the brachial plexus in the coronal plane, and it just looks like strings of spaghetti flowing uh, through the thoracic outlet there. You can definitely see it in axial plane as well. There's the anterior scalene muscle. Right behind that are the stringy, spaghetti-like elements of the brachial plexus. Uh, unfortunately, in axial and coronal plane, it's harder to make out the individual nerves. It just looks like a twist of spaghetti. And so um, that's why the sagittal, cutting them in cross-section, is the way to go. The scalene triangle is perhaps the key concept of brachial plexus anatomy. If you're going to spend some time on a slide, spend it on this slide. So let me run through this anatomy. Here's the anterior scalene muscle, there's the middle scalene muscle, and there's the posterior scalene muscle. You can see them along their length in the sagittal plane. The middle and posterior scalene muscles are often indistinguishable from one another and appear as one muscle mass. If you take the anterior and middle scalene muscle along with the apex of the lung, that forms a triangle. That is the scalene triangle. What runs through the scalene triangle? The trunks of the brachial plexus. Trunks. The trunks of the brachial plexus are running through the scalene triangle. Upper, middle, lower trunk. One, two, three trunks of the brachial plexus running through the scalene triangle. But there's something else in the scalene triangle along with these nerves. There's this big uh, circular in cross-section object here. There's flow void in the center. That's the subclavian artery. The subclavian artery accompanies the trunks of the brachial plexus through the scalene triangle. Okay, so if that's the subclavian artery, where's the subclavian vein? 
The subclavian vein is out here. It's right behind the clavicle, as right where the subclavian vein ought to be. And it's coming medially to join with the internal jugular vein. It's going to run right behind the sternocleidomastoid here. It's going to join with that internal jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. So let's think for a second. Does that mean that the anterior scalene muscle runs between the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein? Yes, that's exactly right. The anterior scalene muscle runs between the subclavian artery and subclavian vein, separating those two inseparable vascular structures. All right, back to the scalene triangle one more time. The trunks of the brachial plexus, upper, middle, and lower trunks, and the subclavian artery found in the scalene triangle. When you start your analysis of the brachial plexus, start here. Take an unenhanced T1-weighted sequence, Find this triangle. This is your reference point. Now you can follow these nerves medially back into the cervical nerve roots. You can follow them out laterally into the arm. You can uh, link up your T1 and T2 next to each other and find the nerves on a fat suppressed T2 where they otherwise, otherwise might be hiding. This is the image to start on when you are analyzing the brachial plexus. The most important thing to take away from this lecture. All right, let's talk about some pathology in the brachial plexus. Trauma is perhaps the most common thing that we're called upon to assess in the brachial plexus. This is somebody who had a, a trauma to their shoulder or upper chest and their arm is weak. That's usually the clinical scenario. The sorts of things that we're looking for here, most often we're looking for a hematoma that is infiltrating around the brachial plexus. That's usually pretty good news because these hematomas will resolve over time and the weakness will go away without any cervical uh, surgical intervention. Sometimes if it's a big ball of clot, it's worth going in surgically. Usually you just watch it get better. Uh, clavicular fracture is very scary because there's not a lot of room between the clavicle and the first rib and that thoracic outlet, a concept we'll come back to, the thoracic outlet can be compromised. Uh, nerve root avulsions and pseudomeningocele. These two concepts go hand in hand. When your arm is yanked from your shoulder, uh, most, the most common example of this is patients who are uh, water skiing. Uh, when the boat takes off, the arm gets yanked away from the body and uh, classic, classic cause of a, of a nerve root avulsion. This usually is accompanied by a pseudomeningocele, um, but you can get either without the other potentially. Still, they're closely related concepts. So what does a hematoma of the brachial plexus look like? What it looks like is the inability to make out the nerves as discrete round objects in cross-section. If you can't see the nerves discreetly, if it looks just hazy all around the nerves, that's that infiltrative hematoma infiltrating into the fat planes and preventing that fat from being a nice, discrete, sharp contrast to the nerves. So here's our, break, here's our scaling triangle, as promised, and uh, there's subclavian artery down there. This is where we should be seeing the trunks of the brachial plexus, and all we see are these hazy areas. There's no discrete circular objects like we saw in that normal anatomy case. If we follow this out more laterally, we see these vague blobs um, out as, as we head out into the arm. We want discrete round objects, not vague areas that are poorly defined. This is hematoma surrounding the brachial plexus and causing a brachial plexopathy. This is another example of a hematoma. We're a little further out into the arm now, a little more lateral. And instead of nice, crisp, round objects here, we just have this vague blob, intermixed fat and, and dark signal. Um, very difficult to make out the individual nerves, right? Here's the artery, there's the vein, but the nerves just can't be made out as individual structures. Helping us out here is the T2-weighted image where you can see uh, increased T2 signal all through this area here. Remember that the most likely place to get a hematoma is between the clavicle and the first rib. That's because the clavicle slams back 
when you get struck in the chest, slams back and hits the first rib and crushes everything in between, crushes this whole thoracic outlet, which is the way we get from the neck into the arm. This thoracic outlet between the clavicle and the first rib is the bottleneck of this system. And if you crush those two bones against each other, you're going to get a hematoma right in between them. So this is the classic location, not the scaling triangle. This is the classic location, the thoracic outlet for a hematoma infiltrating uh, surrounding the nerves and causing a lot of edema. Usually there's tons of edema that goes with that. One more hematoma example to emphasize this concept of the thoracic outlet. Here is the clavicle. Here is the first rib. This gap right here is the thoracic outlet. That's how you get from the neck out into the arm. Arteries, nerves, everything's got to go through this little thoracic outlet. And if you slam your clavicle back into your first rib, you cause a hematoma right in this narrow space. It may even have some surrounding enhancement on the post-contrast imaging, right? But you can't make out individual nerve roots here. You can make out the artery and the vein, but all of the nerves of the brachial plexus that should be here, we should be into divisions at this point, all those divisions should be here as discrete round dots, and they're all just mixed up into this hematoma. Thankfully, this will get better with time. The next concept in trauma is nerve root avulsion. When you are looking on a titrated sagittal image at the neural foramina, you should see a, an oval high T2 signal area with a dark object in the middle. That dark object is the nerve root and the surrounding bright signal is the nerve root sleeve that extends out for a little ways, a little bit of CSF accompanying the nerve until the sleeve collapses around the nerve. If you see a large oval area of bright T2 signal, that's CSF. Where's the nerve in the center? That nerve root has been torn, avulsed, it has retracted. There's supposed to be a nerve in the center here. That nerve's not there. That's a nerve root avulsion. Notice how much bigger the CSF space is here compared to the other levels. Right? That's because this nerve root avulsion is accompanied by a pseudomeningocele. So it's not just the nerve root that's torn, it's also the dura of that nerve sheath is torn and the CSF is collecting in the surrounding soft tissues, forming a pseudomeningocele. These two often go together. Here's another example of a nerve root avulsion here on these gradient sequences. It might be harder to make out the nerve and determine whether the nerve's intact, but you can get a sense of that pseudomeningocele much better here. Uh, this is much larger than would be expected for just a small nerve sheath accompanying the nerve out, right? Um, even a nerve sheath diverticulum never extends this far out. So we're dealing here with a nerve root avulsion. We're dealing with pseudomeningocele. This one happens to also be a nerve root avulsion, almost always at the same time. Sometimes you can get a pseudomeningocele without the avulsion. Uh, here you can see that there is still a central nerve in the middle of this enlarged CSF space running through the neural foramen. So it is possible to get a pseudomeningocele here without the avulsion. That nerve is still intact. This nerve is still intact, displaced by that pseudomeningocele. So multi-level, that's often the case with uh, pseudomeningoceles and nerve root avulsions. They can be multi-level. Another example here, this time using myelography, you know, we expect that the, uh, the contrast will you know, form a little point and then fade out pretty quickly as the nerve sheath collapses around the nerve. When you see the contrast extending all the way out through the foramen and out into the surrounding soft tissues, that's a problem. We're going to take the next cut and see that that uh, contrast actually goes all the way out way past the vertebral body. That's contrast leakage. That's a pseudomeningocele. Um, and you may or may not be able to tell whether the nerve root is avulsed. Uh, in this case, that nerve root is also avulsed. That concludes the first half of the lecture on brachial plexus imaging.